Hello, my name is Justin Bengry. I'm one of the founders of the Notches blog, and as part of our discussion of recent books that address topics in the history of sexuality, we've started a series called Notches on the Bookshelf, where we bring together uh, authors and others interested in, in these topics to, to discuss these new works. So we're really, uh, we're really pleased today to have uh, Chris Bryant and Richard Grayson joining us um, to, well, have a really great conversation, I think, about uh, Chris's new book. Um, by way of introductions, um, Chris is Chris Bryant has been Member of Parliament for the Rwanda since 2001 um, and held numerous positions in the government and opposition. He's also the author of a number of books, uh, most recently, The Glamour Boys, The Secret History of the Rebels Who Fought for Britain to Defeat Hitler, um, in which, with which we'll be in conversation. Uh, Richard Grayson is Professor of 20th Century History at Goldsmiths University of London, where he's also uh, the author of a number of books and articles on World War I and on appeasement. So I'm looking forward to a really great conversation. So to start us off, um, Chris, uh, welcome uh, to both you and Richard. Um, I just want to dive right in. Could you tell us to begin with um, how you came to, um, to, to research and, and study the lives of the men that appear in the book and what your, what your major findings are? I was writing a biography of Parliament, uh, which was meant to be a kind of history of Parliament from the beginning of time uh, right up until the fall of Thatcher. And uh, it ended up being a two volume uh, uh, project. But when I was researching the Second World War and the run up to the Second World War, I came across a phrase about Colonel Jack McNamara, who was the Tory MP for Chelmsford from 1935 until his death in December 1944. And it said that he was a far right, virtually fascist um, MP uh, who employed Guy Burgess's, who, the, the Soviet spy, as his researcher um, and used to go on sex trips to Berlin, um, meeting with gay Nazis. Uh, and uh, on one occasion played table tennis with Nazis uh, or fascists in Paris, um, uh, where the uh, across a dining table where the role of the net was played by a very fit Belgian cyclist who was draped across the table naked. Now, that was an intrinsically kind of fascinating story, really, and I delved a bit and then I came across, it, it turned out that quite a lot of those, that the elements of that story were untrue. Um, he wasn't a fascist. He, he, he uh, um, uh, was like many conservative MPs of the time uh, uh, in favour of the British Empire. He was a, he, he'd grown up in India um, and he did, he did employ Guy Burgess and he probably did go on all sorts of sex trips. Um, but he was one of the team of MPs who... Uh, uh, many of whom were gay or bisexual, um, who campaigned against uh, Neville Chamberlain's policy of appeasement, um, certainly through from, in his case, from 1936 through to the war in 1939. Uh, and then he, ended, he, he served in active service during the war and was killed in, 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 serve, in active service. Um, and that he became the kind of nucleus of me going, right, well, that's another story I'd be delighted to tell because um, nobody knows about this kind of... The, the group um, that he became a part of, which also had Eden and Churchill in it, everybody knows about their role in um, opposing appeasement. But when you look at the rest of the group, which numbered between, I don't know, 12 and 25, something like that, um, who were called the Glamour Boys by Neville Chamberlain as, as a way of dismissing them, um, uh, suggesting something untoward about their sexuality, um, you find quite a lot of other intriguing characters. So I, and I, what I wanted to investigate was, um, was their sexuality um, intrinsic to the sustained fortitude that they showed both in their political life, swimming against the stream of public opinion, we might, Richard might want to con uh, question that concept of um, public opinion in a, in a moment. Um, but was their, their sexuality, the fact that they were different from other people, an intrinsic part of their bravery, which then led on to several of them being killed in action in the war? Um, or was it um, completely irrelevant? And in a sense, that's the kind of tension of the book. 
Thanks very much. With that, I'm, that's actually a great transition into Richard's yeah. question. So with that, I'm going to hand things over to Richard to continue the rest of the, uh, the conversation. Thank you, Chris. I, I actually, I'll, I'll pick up in a moment just on, on the point you were just, just making about um, whether their sexuality was intrinsic to the positions they were taking. But I just wanted to step back a bit, first of all, and say I love the book. I thought it was really brilliant. It's really well written and such an engaging read. Um, I first came across the term the glamour boys as an undergraduate about 30 years ago and uh, then it was used obviously to describe the, uh, the the group around Eden but I think the assumption among a lot of historians was that it was really just referring to styles of dress and that there wasn't the um, there wasn't the suggestion that there was anything about their sexuality and i just wondered if you could say a little bit more about the actual term glamour and how that was used in the 1930s so glamour was um a, it, it was a word that came back into fashion um through um the novels of walter scott and it was it referred to a a, a glamour was a spell that could be cast normally by a female sprite of some kind or other uh, or a witch over men um and so it implied something essentially feminine um naughty untoward something that led you down a wrong path and made you do things that you didn't you knew you shouldn't um and uh, and quite often there were movies in the 1930s which were which all whenever it was uh, the word glamour was used it meant somebody stealing somebody's heart inappropriately and making them go down a wrong path yeah. and I think that that's that was the intention and then and it was just intriguing to me that nobody I think ever sat down and went right when Eden resigned as foreign secretary at the start of 1938 effectively forced out by Neville Chamberlain and um, who did he spend his time with in the next 48 hours um well not much with his wife um he, Philip Sassoon um I think by everybody's reckoning now uh, uh um a, a gay, Jewish, wealthy um, baronet, uh, government minister, um, Rob Bernays, um, who was uh, at least bisexual. He married during the war, but uh, um, uh, Jack McNamara, he, he consults him. Harry Crookshank, uh, also gay, another uh, minister. Um, it, it's it's a long list. And, and I suspect also probably his PPS, Jim Thomas, was, uh, he certainly never married and um, uh, my suspicion is that he was also gay as well, though maybe he didn't ever do anything about it. So, and when I started putting that together, I realised that the, the group of people um, around Churchill and Eden were at least a third of them were gay men. At least and, a third. And, and so on, exciting. Yeah, it really is. And so on that point then, uh, and picking up where you left off in, in your introduction, did you conclude, do you conclude that uh, their sexuality is intrinsic to their arguments that somehow being outsiders to some extent in their private lives makes the glamour boys more willing, more prone to take unpopular positions, even if the fact, at least to the general public, of their outsiderness is, is secret? Well, I think there's two things um, that was distinctive about any gay man during this period. And uh, gay is obviously an anachronism as a term, but um, for shorthand here today. Um, uh, first of all, you had to be good at subterfuge. You had to be really good at um, switching your pronouns, for, pronouns from he and his to she and hers very quickly. Um, in reference to anybody, you had to pretend that you weren't over meticulous about your dress. That was a very clear sign of homosexuality. There was a book that was produced at the time which gave advice to people on how to um, get away with it. And um, quite, uh, quite a lot of gay men, of course, at the period married, partly because they were terrified of being discovered, but also because, you know, at the time you could go to prison for two years with hard labour and whipping um, for homosexual acts. Um, uh, or you got married because you didn't want to be lonely. Um, and quite a few of the people in the book did get married, though I think that they were predominantly homosexual. Um, uh, so there's that. You have to be good at subterfuge, and that is quite useful in a House of Commons where the majority, where, where um, Neville Chamberlain had a majority of 250, not 
uh, you know, that number of MPs, a majority of over all other parties. Um, and the government whips were really, really ferociously powerful. Um, but secondly, yes, I think they were so used to ploughing their own furrow. There's lots of extended metaphors I could do now. Ploughing their own furrow, swimming against the tide, whatever you want, um, in the way they lived their private lives, um, that they were content to swim against the tide of public opinion. Now, it's a much contested um, issue in history as to whether there was such a thing as public opinion in, in the 1930s. Um, but what is certainly true, it, because we didn't have opinion polls and things like that, um, and the one sort of poll you had, the peace um, ballot that was done in 1933, um, you could argue pointed in two directions at the same time. On the one hand, no, we should never have another war with Germany. But yes, um, if uh, um, if Germany, if, if another country does something terrible, then we should use military force to intervene. Mm -hmm. um, but, but what is certainly true is that nearly every politician of the time thought that public opinion, because this is what the newspapers represented, thought that public opinion was against another war, full stop, and therefore supported appeasement. So in a sense, whether it was public opinion or not, yeah. it's sort of irrelevant because it's just that's what everybody thought. And they they disagreed with that. They were accused of being warmongers. They had their phones tapped and they had nasty articles written about them asking why they were still bachelors and all that kind of stuff. So, yes, they were definitely courageous mm -hmm. um, in the in the way they approached their politics and in the way they approached their private lives. We might come. Well, we will come back to uh the anti-appeasement cause, but I just wanted to ask a little bit more about definitions of sexuality at the time, because um, you use the term queer in the book as a, as a modern term, and, 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 and in some ways it feels very appropriate for the 1930s and the kinds of lives they were living, but it's not used then. And you've even got, so somebody like Harold Nicholson, who's obviously a central figure in the book, as you point out in his in, in his biography, uh, he's married to Vita Sackville West. Famously, they both have homosexual affairs. He's a National Labour MP, having been a diplomat and is a minister during the war. His use of language is interesting. There's a point where he says, uh, I don't have affairs with younger men because I'm homosexual, but because I revere my own youth or words to that effect. And... Uh, uh, I seem to remember a comment uh, from one of the people in the book about a party where they'd said a dreadful place full of homosexuals. And yet that was the uh, that was the sort of lifestyle they were actually leading. Uh, and I just wondered how people uh, who we might now describe as gay actually saw themselves and defined themselves at the time. So that. There's the, 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 there's the question of terminology, which is really difficult. Writing now about a period when we would use terms like gay and bisexual. Um, so, for instance, about Harold Nicholson. Is he bisexual or was he a homosexual man who happened to be married and had kids? Um, difficult. Uh, he Certainly the word bisexual didn't exist at the time. So you, it, it, that is a clear anachronism. Homosexual was a term that was around, mostly used in clinical settings, but more common in, in the kind of, in the period from kind of 1910 to 1940 were terms like Uranist and earning and pervert, um, things like that. Um, much debated whether they anybody conceived of somebody being in essence homosexual rather than somebody engaging in homosexual acts or same-sex acts. Um, and the law, of course, has never prescribed somebody from being homosexual. It prescribed homosexual acts. So it's quite a difficult period, in a sense, to write about. And, and um, I, and undoubtedly, sometimes, one of your ways of hiding your sexuality was being very rude about other people who you thought to be homosexual, who were camp or effeminate or um, ostentatious or flamboyant or theatrical or whatever. Um, and, um, and and that, incidentally, was a besetting evil of um, the homosexual uh, campaign for law reform all the way up until uh, very recent years, that um, uh, some of the people who said the nastiest things about gay men were gay men. 
um, as a means of kind of pretending that they weren't part of that crowd. Um, but it's interesting, isn't it? There's one moment when um, Jack McNamara uh, is standing in the by-election in 1934 and um, in the East End of London. Uh, he has visited Germany several times and including quite recently and in a much publicized visit. And he is accused of being a friend of Hitler and um, anti-Semitic and um, so on by the, by the opposition campaign. But the Labour Party newspaper, um, its headline is Queer Antics from Tory MP, uh, from Tory candidate. Now, I think that that is, that is deliberate. I don't think that's accidental. Uh, more odd is when Jack dies, the eulogy by his local vicar in the Chelmsford um, Chronicle, I think it is, local newspaper, is it, the headline is, um, he loved men. Now, I think that's his reference to being in the armed forces and, and um, not being a snobbish officer and mixing it with, a, with, with the lads, as it were. But you could read that as a double entendre as well. Yeah, exactly. No, it, it would be hard, I think, particularly the queer antics headline is, is really, really striking. I, I wanted to move on to uh, anti-appeasement. Um, a, a lot was written about this many years ago, and uh, I, I think people felt that there wasn't much new to say about uh, anti-appeasers, perhaps even... 15 or 20 years ago certainly the last thing i wrote was more than 15 years ago um, but it did strike me that you, you there was just so much in this book that was genuinely new about the uh, the anti-appeasers and i i think strikingly uh the the effects of the visits to germany and, and what they what they were seeing there that that was that was really important but it got me thinking about uh what fundamentally was the key contribution of the glamour boys to the anti-appeasement cause and and can you uh rank not perhaps not rank but just assess their relative importance uh compared to people like uh churchill leo amory eden uh, and and others well in a sense, the people you've just named were the were the were the, were the big beasts, weren't they? In uh, um, roaming the forest in, in this in this field, um, but um, the big beasts needed lots of other fellows um, to sit with them, to work with them. And my my feeling is that that little group, in particular, of Ronnie Cartland, Harold Nicholson, Jack McNamara. Um, Victor Caslett eventually, uh, he took quite a long time to get there. Um, uh, Rob Bernays, um they met for dinner like all the time, mm. much more than all the others in the group. They were a social unit in themselves. And I think that that played a really significant part in maintaining the, the kind of strength of that group of people who were refuseniks or rebels or insurgents or whatever, however you want to call them, through from Eden's resignation um, in 1938, through the Munich Pact, all the way through to um, war in September uh, 1939, and, and then obviously to Churchill's taking over in, in May 1940. Um, I think there were a couple of moments when Ronnie Cartland's intervention, for instance, in the August a German debate in 1939. I think that was the moment that kind of blew it all open emotionally, um, much more than any of the other contributions that day. Um, uh, so yeah, I think they they, they played it in essence a kind yeah. of role as a glue. Yes. For the group, which which yeah, others sense. weren't able to do because they you know they they used to go to the Boulestin all the time because it was run by their gay friend Marcel Boulestin. Yeah. Um, you know. Um, yeah. And I think if Philip Sassoon had, la had he died obviously just before the war, and I think if he'd lasted, he would have had a, a much enhanced reputation in the end as well. Okay. So that then makes me think about the coherence or otherwise of the anti-appeasement movement, if we can even use that term. Uh, and so if you're thinking about the different groups of people who claim to have been anti-appeasers in the post-war years of course that's a bandwagon that everybody wants to be on <laughs> and, and some of Eden's career eventually becoming prime minister is built on that but even he's somebody who abstains in the in the Munich vote 
so he's not that consistent. Somebody like Leo Amory is interesting here as well. Uh, so he he's the one who is seen as a consistent anti-appeaser uh, because he stands up in 1940 and tells uh, Neville Chamberlain in the, in the name of God go. But the research I did on him um, suggested that actually the, the label anti-appeaser is a little bit problematic because his vision of 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 the world is one in which the British Empire is really strong and he but he's quite happy for Hitler to have at least economic control over Central and Eastern Europe in lots of ways so if you're sitting there in 1930 in, in well in 1945 it may look like Amory was an anti-appeaser but in 1938 I'm not sure that that's quite clear similarly the other bits of the movement uh, the Communist Party Obviously, it all comes across, uh, off the rails with the Nazi-Soviet pact, but their focus in the late 30s is on the uh, grand, potential for a grand alliance between Britain, France and the Soviet Union, which Britain and France want nothing to do with, and on recruiting for the Spanish Civil War as part of what they describe as a war against fascism. The Liberal Party is small in parliamentary terms, but they do have prominent figures still around. Uh, Archibald Sinclair is important, Violet Bonham Carter is. Lloyd George, of course, is incredibly complex in all of this because um, he's rather attracted to Hitler in some ways. So, it, compliments him. Exactly. Um, Churchill wrote an essay on Hitler in 1934, I think, which was produced in Great Lives, saying... We don't yet know whether Hitler will be a force for good or force for evil. Um, Austin Chamberlain is an interesting figure, Neville's half-brother, um, but he died in 1937, having started speaking out. Um, so when you look round at the different elements of anti-appeasement, they're quite scattered, they're quite uh, diverse. How, how coherent is the anti-appeasement case or, or is this really a post-war reading of the 1930s? I think there are two elements to this. One is anti-fascism um, and the other is uh, what to do about Hitler's territorial ambitions. And I would slightly separate the two. Uh, you know, a lot of Conservative MPs passionately supported Franco, um, in, include, partly because they thought it was uh, the battle against communism and, and the real Manichaean battle in the world at the time was between communism and common sense or decency kind of thing. Um, but interestingly, Jack McNamara uh, was on the other side uh, on, on the Spanish Civil War um, as, a, as a conservative MP and visited um, Spain in 1936 and organised uh, support for Basque children who'd been effectively made orphans by um, Franco's... Um, Franco's troops. Um, equally, um, th when Rothermere produced his article, Hurrah for the Black Shirts, in 1934 in the, um, in the Daily Mail, uh, it's not incidentally often reported in the Daily Mirror, but it was also in the Daily Mirror, that article. Um, the first two people to attack it were Rob Bernays, um, who I write about in the book, Liberal National MP by this stage, um, I think, mostly homosexual. Um, and, of course, Stanley Baldwin's own son, Oliver Baldwin, who was also homosexual, though a Labour MP. Um, and Rob Bernays and Rob Boothby were both warning about Hitler back in 1932, long before Churchill. So um, there's that element. Um, and um, But what I noted was as you referred to earlier, each of the people I write about in the book had their own personal moment when they changed. Mm. Uh, Rob Bernays was very early, um, but Jack McNamara was a member of the Anglo-German Association, never incidentally a member of the Anglo-German Fellowship, as has been alleged by every single historian I've ever read. Incorrect. Um, he, but, and he changed when, I, when he visited Dachau in 1936 mm. and saw the brutality being meted out because there were homosexuals in there. Um, uh, Victor Cazalet, it's much later. It's when he goes to visit Austria and he sees, well, it's probably two things. It's when his friend Gottfried von Kram, the tennis star, 
uh, with whom he played tennis at Wimbledon, in, is arrested by Hitler and uh, imprisoned for his sexuality. Um, and uh, Victor has to help his um, male Jewish lover get out of Germany to um, originally Portugal and then Palestine. Um, and then secondly, when he goes to Austria and all the all his rich Jewish friends are saying to him, please, please take me back to the UK. Even if I have to come back as your gardener, I have to be able to get out. Um, and so, and and Harold Nicholson has his own personal, um, you know, uh, the person who translated his books in Germany is arrested and sent to Dachau as well. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, Kurt Wagenthal, his um, granddaughter has just been in touch with me. She had no idea that her grandfather was homosexual. So, um I think everybody had their own individual journey, and I, I think that history has slightly got it wrong to say that there were these three or four great heroes that turned the nation round. Mm. Um, actually, politics in this period was a was quite a complex morass, obscured by the fact that you had a government with a massive majority, and then there's little moments like. Ronnie Cartland, who we've not talked about much, Barbara Cartland's younger brother. Who knew Barbara Cartland had a younger brother? Um, but um, Ronnie Cartland, um, you know, um, uh, joining uh, Hugh Dalton, subsequently Labour Chancellor after the war, um, who liked a young gentleman as well, um, in the smoking room and discussing the dictatorship um, in the British government. And obviously Hugh Dalton, I think, was quite significant in the whole process of bringing conservatives conservative anti chamberlain rebels on board with labor um one of the things i've tried to explain in the book is through um philip sassoon's yearly um air estimates debates yes how complicated this process of appeasement or not appeasement was because if you spent too much money on armaments you lost the whole of the labor party you said we shouldn't be spending money on war um, uh, but um, but if you didn't spend enough on armaments, you lost the people mm -hmm. like Churchill who were, who were saying that we had to be strong. Churchill, of course, himself uh, laid the problem there when he was chancellor because he said that we would never invest. Well, it was a 10-year a strategy, wasn't it, of, of not mm -hmm. investing in our armed forces. So it's a difficult coalition to hold together. Um, and also you... Uh, you mentioned the constraints of public opinion, or at least what people believe public opinion to be. Why wasn't anti-appeasement more successful? Do you mean why wasn't it successful earlier? Yes. Well, I think partly because um, the 1931 election had led to a massive uh, national government majority, which um, was cradled by um mcdonald um looked after by baldwin and then sustained and used and abused by chamberlain yeah. um and so in the commons if you spoke out in any different way from anybody else you got howled down yeah well that leads on to actually my final question which probably uh involves reflecting on on your political life as much as your uh, work on this as an author, but I, I thought it would be interesting to discuss some of the, the difficult choices that politicians can face about whether to become a minister or maintain some degree of freedom. And of course, the, the figure in the book, I think, who stands out most here is one that you've mentioned already, Rob Bernays, who is a, a, a minister in the late 30s, and to some extent is um, constrained by that. So uh, how do you think someone like him and perhaps the others navigated this difficult choice? Well, he was conflicted about it. He, you know, he, 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 like every MP in history, you always want to stay in office if you've got into office because that's your means of effecting change. Otherwise, you're just throwing snowballs at the bridge, really. Um, and um, he, you know, there were a couple of moments when basically it's pretty clear from his diaries and his letters to his sister Lucy, who was in uh, who was in Brazil, um, and um, Harry Crookshank, who was another uh, government minister at the time, it's pretty clear that Rob told fibs. Um, you know, he he gave a very sort of um, he gave himself ten out of ten, I think, <laughs> when really he should have been getting maybe seven out of ten, um, and. 
it, it must have been very difficult because I can imagine him going to dinner with Walter Elliott and others and Harold Nicholson and saying, well, obviously, I completely agree. Um, this, you know, It looks like Chamberlain's policy is a complete disaster um, and he's such an arrogant man and all that kind of stuff. But on the other hand, if I'm not in the room when the decisions are being made, um, it, it, you know, it's that line in, in Hamilton, the music, um, uh, the room where it happens. That, that's what a politician always wants to, uh, you know, that's what they see as their ultimate aim is to be in the room where it happens so you can make the right decision. Um, and I and I think I think if Rob Bernays was sitting here now, he'd probably say, you know what, there are a couple of times when I should have been braver. Do you think he could have behaved differently at any particular moment? Oh or? yeah, I think if he had resigned over Munich, which he you know was very tempted to do, um, or in the spring of 1939, um, that uh, that would undoubtedly have made a significant difference yeah um and and maybe apart from the else it might also have mean i mean for his own career it might have been better because churchill might have then kept him on as a minister in 1940 yeah. um, instead of sacking him um but um but uh, you know he made a he, he it's difficult not to conclude that finances made a difference as well because as a minister you had a significant extra salary um and those questions arise all the time, I guess, for uh, ministers when they're thinking how, um, you know, how much is their conscience worth? Yeah, it's definitely uh, tightrope walk walking is something that comes through the book in so many different ways, whether it's their ministerial and political careers or their private lives. And it's uh, it's been really fascinating to talk about it. Thanks, Chris. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you both for a really stimulating conversation. And uh, thank you, Chris, for sharing this, this research and this story too little known in, in queer history. Um, and, and Richard for joining us today to, uh, to discuss it with Chris. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll wind things up. Thank you both so much.